All right, so we're going to go ahead and keep this uh, ball rolling. Here we got Joe here with the SSH is the next back door. Hi, everybody. My name is Joe Skihan. I'm running the product team at uh, Venify. Um, I'm going to talk about SSH today. Uh, is it kind of noisy out there? Do somebody want to close those doors, maybe? Um, so I'm going to talk about SSH, and I'm going to specifically talk about uh, potential areas of concern around SSH uh, when using it in your environment. Uh, just to kind of get us all on the same page, what is SSH? W what exactly is it? Well, I got an analogy to I got an analogy to start with. SSH is to Telnet as SSL is to HTTP, and the analogy has its limits. So just kind of work with me here a little bit. But for for web traffic, we had HTTP, and essentially we took an un encrypted set of uh, an unencrypted transport and and we added SSL to it to provide encryption so that the data could not be snooped on the wire and we provided authentication so that when I go to my bank I actually know that I have reasonable confidence that I'm actually talking to my bank when I do that well historically Telnet has been used for remote access to um, most every non-Windows system there is, except mainframe, non-Windows, non-mainframe. Traditionally, t t Telnet was used to do that. And now, SSH is used to do that. And, and, and again, I'm not suggesting that SSH encapsulates Telnet or anything like that. It's not the case. But SSH is now used to provide the same functionality. And with it, I get encryption and I get an authentication as well. It's very different authentication and it's very different encryption. And we'll talk about those pieces. But just to provide a basis, OK, we're, we're, we are replacing what used to be remote access over Telnet with something new, essentially, which is SSH. And where is it used? Uh, so SSH is used anywhere you need remote access. That could be a user that needs remote access to perform some operation. It could be administrators. And in fact, many, many things uh, in, in the world are administered via SSH. And you could play with percentages, but, but let's say a very, very, very large numbers of things in, in the world are, are administered through SSH. And then applications. There are a number of applications that people use that may be using SSH underneath them, whether you're aware of them or not. Uh, and then the other half of that, though, or the other portion of that is server-to-server -server communication. And, and in, in these cases, these are servers communicating with other servers performing some kind of automated activity. Uh, in working with our customers, um, fin mostly large financial organizations, large telecom, those kind of companies, uh, they let us know that about 90 to 95 percent um, of all SSH communications is actually automated communications. It doesn't involve a person typing at a keyboard. It involves two systems communicating without anyone else involved. And as I mentioned, this is kind of what's used everywhere, right? It, it, as a rule of thumb, if it's not Windows and it's not a mainframe, it's pretty much uses SSH for remote access. That, that's pretty much the case these days. Um, and you can say that. Now, when it comes to SSH and its challenges, we're actually in pretty good shape right now, right? Um, SSH2 protocol really can be considered pretty sound. Right? That's, that's not the case with SSH1, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but um, SSH2 is actually in very good shape. Uh, the, the mechanism they use for key exchange, the, the Diffie-Hellman stuff, there's some, there's some really nice things in it that, that, that can let you sleep more peacefully at night. Um, and OpenSSH, as an implementation, you know, if you look back at the history of, of, of security-related defects in OpenSSH, you know, it's in a lot better shape than, than many, many other applications that are out there. So in terms of the protocol itself and, and the common implementations, generally they're considered quite secure, but there are seemingly enormous risks in the configuration of SSH and in its access management. And I'm going to talk about four areas. I'm going to talk about protocol support. I'm going to talk about key sizes. I'll talk about implementations and how people typically use SSH and, and how they acquire it and how they manage it over its life cycle. And then finally, I'll talk about trust and authorization. Um, I'm going to provide some statistics throughout the presentation here, and I'll provide two sets of statistics. 
The first set of t statistics comes from a Fortune 1000 survey. Effectively, we went to fortune.com and got the list of, you know, the Fortune 1000, and then we went and saw what IP address ranges those companies had owned, and basically looked on port 22 and saw what there was to see, and brought back the data. There was about 400 hits um, on those 10,000 addresses that we scanned. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that as one set of data. Now, I have other sets of data. As we've collected hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of SSH keys, and I'll, I'll contrast the Fortune 1000 data with the more broad general data uh, that we have found. Uh, but let me go ahead and just jump right in. I probably have about 18 minutes left. Uh, first of all, protocol support. This is, you know, when I talked about SSH being sound, right? SSH is, you know, in pretty good, darn good shape. Well, that's not kind of the case originally, right? Back in 95, I believe it was, when SSH first came out, it was a very different protocol than what we know of today as SSH2. I mentioned, for example, the Diffie-Hellman idea of getting a shared key so that you can encrypt something, right? That's a really neat process because, you know, me and another party can agree in clear text between, you know, over the wire on a key and no third party can figure out what that key is based on what they see on the wire. Well, SSH1 wasn't like that. SSH1 was much more like SSL in the fact that somebody comes up with a key and securely gets that shared between two people, which is a very different situation. Um, SSH1 additionally has known vulnerabilities for uh, command injection. That's kind of tough if you think about the idea of, um, you know, re remoting into something, right, and you're typing in commands. Um, if someone could inject commands into that, that would be a bad thing. So you probably don't want SSH1 protocol running in your environment. And in the Fortune 1000, what we found was about one in four systems that we hit support SSH1. Now, I'm sure that most of you are sitting in the aisle counting the number of people there and you're saying to yourself, well, I'm three and I'm one of the three that doesn't have SSH1 in my environment, so I, I don't need to worry about that. And in fact, as you're going to see as I dig through the data a little more here, um, it's not that way. What it is is that pretty much every one of you that have SSH, about a quarter of your systems have SSH1 enabled. It's not that some of you have it and some of you don't. It's pretty much everybody has SSH1 enabled. You probably don't know it, and, and you, you really do wish you didn't. Um, the next piece I want to talk about is key sizes and key types. And let me first of all start off by saying that there's, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong or horrible about having a small key size for your server key, right? Because that server key in SSH2 is primarily used for, for trust, right? It's not like I'm encrypting the conversation with that server key, and so if I have a small key, I, I risk a brute force attack. That's not really the case. Um, instead, what we found was um, uh, the default key length for OpenSSH was, was changed to 2048 um, about six years ago. Um, they were actually ahead of the curve a, a bit. NIST didn't recommend that until a couple years ago. What we found was about two-thirds of the keys were 1024-bit keys. And that was an interesting thing. And, and what we, as you start digging through the data, what it, what it looks like, right, when you correlate key size version numbers and identifier strings, what you notice is that everybody installs with the defaults. Nobody, nobody chooses things that aren't defaults. I say nobody. 99% from what I can tell of people that install this or systems that they received, they were installed in a default configuration and never touched. And if what that means is it's got a 1024-bit key, one, it means it's probably about five years old, maybe older, and two, it means that user keys for authentication probably were using the same default key size and are probably 1024-bit keys. And that could be a problem. We'll talk about authorization later on uh, at, towards the end of the slide deck. But if I've got 1024-bit keys being used for, authenticate, for authentication, then I do have concern about brute force going against those keys um, for access. The, the last point down here is RSA1 keys, and, and again, as I said earlier, there's nothing inherently wrong with an RSA1 key. It's a little different than an RSA key, um, but it's what points to SSH1, right? So when you see an RSA1 key, you want to go look more carefully and find out if there's SSH1 there as well, because that, as we talked about on the previous slide, wasn't such a good idea. So here's what the data looks like. Um, 
first of all, really bad stuff, okay? About 12% uh, is either an RSA1 key or a key smaller than 1024. And we even see 512-bit keys. You see keys that small. I got a collection of a couple hundred 512-bit keys that are never, uh, it's constantly surprising to me. Then you have this idea of not good, right? Which is, this is stuff that's A, probably about five years old, maybe a little older, assuming they took all the defaults, um, uh, and B, doesn't, doesn't meet the sizes that you'd want. These numbers look a little different in just a broad internet survey, right? So this is the Fortune 1000 data. This is actually kind of a worst case situation. It looks right now, based on the, the broader surveys, that the really bad stuff is only about 8%, and the really good stuff is up to about almost 30%. And, and, and again, that points back to, in the Fortune 1000, these systems are just older, right? They were installed with the defaults, and they're just older. So this was really interesting. There's a variety of, of data you get back when you, when you hit an SSH server. You get this major and minor version number, which really have nothing at all to do with versions, but have to do with backwards compatibility and figuring out what protocols the server supports. Um, and then you have these, these strings that also actually have a version number, right, and a vendor. And some vendors take the version out and they just say the vendor name. There's no version at all. But, but real clearly, folks install this stuff or they get it and they never touch it. And when people get something and never touch something that relates to security, it, it suggests to me, I think, that people either don't understand SSH or just aren't up to speed on security practices. Because I have a, I have a key that's been duplicated 8,635 times. A private key, right? So as we do these surveys and we go look out, we find duplicate private keys. That's still never-endingly shocking to me. And in fact, about 45% of the keys we find are duplicated. So some vendor has shipped some appliance, this particular example is an appliance, this appliance with pre-generated pre keys, and they're the same pre-generated keys all over the place. Now, the one risk I do have with losing an SSH server key is I risk a man-in-the-middle attack, right? And if I've got the same key, so oh yeah, you think about that, a man in the middle attack, that's not real easy to do, right? If I've got a server and I wanna try to get into the stream and pretend to be that server, I've gotta have a lot of access before I'm gonna be successful at that. But if I've got the same key on tens and tens of thousands of devices out there, well now it's kinda easy to end up in a coffee shop with an access point and, and start figuring out people's passwords because your sample size is so much larger. You have so much more opportunity um, to get into something there. Uh, also, uh, password-based authentication outside the firewall. You know, that, that combined with duplicate keys and a man-in-the-middle attack, you know, that's, a, that's a, a, a bit of a scary thing and that's something that might keep you up awake at night. The last area I wanna talk about is trust and authorization. Trust and authorization when it comes to SSH works in two ways. One, there are clients trusting servers, okay? Essentially, um, when I go to um, my bank, right, I type my bank and, and through the nature of SSL and this, I, this sense that credentials are being presented to me that contain data about who and what they are and that is indicated to me that somebody else has validated this, someone that I trust validates this. That's SSL, right? Well, in SSH, it's not quite the same thing. In SSH, you know, I come into a server and I hit a server for the first time and I don't trust that key, well, I get a dialogue that shows me the, the fingerprint of the key and it asks me if that's okay. And nobody knows if that's okay. Nobody's comparing that to anything, right? These users sit, they get a dialogue up there, they hit okay, so the dialogue will go away. But now you've permanently trusted that. That's like somebody knocking on your door and saying, hi, I'm from your bank, you wanna open an account with me? And you're saying, sure, okay. Because that's kinda how it happens. Now you can get around that, right? And you can manage that. The second part is key-based authentication. Um, if I want, if I have an automated system, right, one server talking to another server in automated fashion, there's, there's nobody there to trust a key. And there's, and there's certainly, I don't want to put passwords in my scripts that are running these automated communications. So I can use key-based authentication. This is really neat. I got a key pair, I've got the private key, and my public key is associated with an account on a server somewhere. And when I hit that server and demonstrate that I have the private key, I'm logged in. 
period. That's that. As long as you have the private key, you get into the account. That's how SSH works. So let's kind of walk through this and what the problem is. Well, first of all, this whole server trust model is all dependent upon the accurate distribution and maintenance. And that means you got to deprecate these keys too. You got to rotate these keys. But I have to distribute previously the server's public key to any client that's going to access that server. I put it in a file called known hosts. And now every time my client hits that server, I can verify as long as the server's address are, hasn't changed and the key's the same, the address and the key, they match up, I trust that server. Um, generally, these things are, are managed very, very poorly. And the poorest part of the management is that trust is typically never revoked. Again, as we worked with our customers and looked at this data, what we found is that trust is always additive. You always add more things to trusted keys, and none of them ever go away. So when that server's taken offline and goes away, it's gone, well, that trust still exists. And anybody wants to go find that server that's gone and go find that private key, since that server's not in use anymore, well, you're trusting them. Explicitly, you're trusting them. The other half of that, again, is authentication, public key authentication. And, and this is a best practice for automated communications because, again, you don't want passwords in all your script files, right? But it requires that, that each client have a key pair and that the public part, the public key, be distributed to all the accounts where it's supposed to be on all the hosts. Right? It works beautifully. And the problem is there's no rigorous management of this stuff going on in the world. Not, not that we've found in our customers. So let's kind of walk through what this looks like. If I'm a, a system two's accessing system one, system one's a server. Um, so system two has system one's public key. It's a known host. So system, system two can talk to system one and it trusts that system one is that system one. And for system two to log into system one, that system two's public key is put in a file called authorized keys. This is an example for OpenSSH, right? So you go into the user's directory, you go to the .ssh directory, there's a file there called authorized keys. You open up that file and you'll find one or more keys in there. Those are public keys. And whoever has the corresponding private key can get into that account, okay? And that's a simple example, but take a look at system three here. This is a much more, much more typical example where a server is also a client, right? So it's got a pair of server keys. Um, it's got a, pair, a whole series of authorized keys. Uh, any number of accounts on that server may have authorized keys. And then it's got known host keys for all the ones that it talks to as well. So now this starts to get a little rough because how many authorized keys are out there, right? There's typically multiple keys per account. That's very, very common. And if there's not multiple keys per account, then people are sharing keys on flash drives, which could be even worse of a problem, right? What about orphaned authorizations? How do you know that all the keys that are authorized keys are actually still in use? How do you know how old they are? How do you know if the person that have had access to them have left the organization or moved on to a different job, right? IT staff rotates about 20% per year. That means in five years, you can kind of assume that everybody's rotated and you ought to have rotated all your keys. Now, you remember how I told you that two thirds of all the keys we found are about five years old or older. So there's a whole lot of keys here that aren't getting rotated. Yeah. Good thing is this is manageable. You can, you can actually do something about this. You can audit these keys, the, the known host keys and the, the authorized keys. This is auditable. You can do this, right? You start by you go to a host, right? You go to some host that runs SSH and you look in the file system under a user's directory in the .ssh directory for a file called authorized keys and you open that file up. And you look for something that looks kind of like that. And if you see that, write it down. <laughs> and, I, and I would suggest you write it down in a spreadsheet, right? So you're going to go to your first host and you're going to open it up and you're going to go to your first account and then you're going to find your first key and you're going to put it where it says key one. You wouldn't actually write key one, you'd actually paste the key there, right? And actually you'd paste all the keys you found for that account right there at the same place and you'd make an indication of that. Then you'd go to the next user account and you'd look for the authorized keys file. You'd open it up, you'd look at the key there, you'd compare it to the keys you've already had, you'd hold them next to each other, you'd compare them, and if they matched, you'd put another X there, right, for the next user, and if they didn't match, you'd add a fourth key. And once you did this on all of your hosts and all of your user accounts, you'd have a really big spreadsheet 
with lots and lots and lots of keys. One of the customers we're working with, they have 4,000 hosts. Each host average between 30 and 60 users. So yeah, it's a really big spreadsheet, right? And, and while you're doing this, you're gonna learn some other stuff. You're gonna notice, first of all, that some of these keys are used an awful lot. And you're gonna notice that some of these users have a whole lot of keys that are authorized to get access to them. You know, you're gonna find root accounts that have 20 keys in them. And you're gonna wonder where those private keys are. And you're gonna start to come across these keys. You notice I've got step 3,627, because this math gets real ugly real fast, and it's not real practical. I, I, I get that, you know, there's a little something to here, but, but this is how you'd have to do it, quite frankly. The next piece you do is you would look for the, pub, the private keys, and you'd figure out what users had access to the private keys that allow them access to what accounts on what hosts. And now that you've done that, you've essentially completed, completed the, the data mining portion of your audit. Because now what you're gonna do is you're gonna find problems. You're gonna find things that probably shouldn't be so. You'll find duplicate private keys. Um, I, I, I generally think private keys shouldn't be duplicated, especially private keys used for um, uh, authorization, right? Um, you'll find public keys that are trusted where you have no evidence of an existing private key. You, you just flat have no idea where the private key is or, or if it's used or, or what. And you'll find um, uh, server keys that are trusted where there's no server that you know of, right? So these are, these are problems that you'll want to go chase down and, and do something about. Um, for your authorized keys, it's a pretty straightforward process. You go to each host, you go to each account, you find all the public keys that are trusted, and you figure out who has them, which ones are unaccounted for, and you get rid of all the ones you possibly can. Be careful in your data mining to make sure you don't break something, because it's kind of the nature of that. If you get rid of a public key that's trusted, that was needed, something's gonna stop working. And remember I mentioned for our customers about 95% of this traffic is all automated stuff, so there's not a user there to do something about it. Instead, something just kind of stops working. So you wanna be real careful as you're doing your data mining operations. On the trusted host keys, you kind of do the same thing, but here you're looking at client machines, right? So you go to each user account, and then each trusted host key, and then evaluate the key you know, is it an active key? Is it a key that's being used? Is it a key that should be trusted? And of course, again, the remediation is to remove those trusted keys where that trust is inappropriate. So we're shooting for 20 minutes here. I think I did fairly well. You know, SSH, especially SSH2, and, and implementations like OpenSSH are, are really con considered pretty secure, you know, pretty confident. You know, something could be announced tomorrow. They could find some vulnerability. but. To the extent that we know, they're actually in pretty good shape, but the risks are in how they're configured, the fact that they're typically not rigorously managed at all, and access management is, for most organizations, most organizations have absolutely no idea. And when you start digging into these authorized keys, what you're ultimately figuring out, it's the equivalent of knowing who knows the password, right? Because now you got a key that you can tie it all together with. I, I, just a couple minutes if I can, I, I, I take one or two questions, I'll be at the back of the room if somebody wants to grab me, but um, if, if that's okay, can we take right there? Similar before step 36,000, I would expect to conclude that I wish I had a better tool than a spreadsheet for solving this problem. What are the opportunities for automating? Yeah, yeah there's, there's a variety of, of alternatives. One of the alternatives is, is there are uh, implementations that include managing the, of this built in, right? So you look at, you know, like the folks at TechT and what they've done, right? If you're willing to go ahead and do that kind of a swap, I'm not sure how you're gonna get that on a Cisco router, but for some portion of your environment, you might be able to do that. It's a, um, for many customers, it's been, um, a difficult challenge to try to do at that level. Um, and there are other companies now uh, coming into the market that are doing this kind of, of um, um, uh, data mining and representation. Um, it so happens that we're one of them. Um, but uh, yeah, so there are automated tools. And yeah, the idea of using a spreadsheet is kind of silly. But uh, really, that's the work that's being done. Yeah. I actually happen to be the security architect for what was formerly SSH Communications, now TechDM. And we actually 
worked on all these bugs, and we actually do have key management in all of our systems, SSH key manager, and we've had it out there since I think about 2004, 2005. Yeah, and one of the best ones about what you guys have done is the certificate-based authentication, yes. which really gets rid of a lot of these concerns. We've had it all automated for a bad part of a decade. Yeah. Did you do much look to see how that compares to the other implementations out there? We, yeah, we had, so the question specifically was, well, how about Tectia SSH and how does that work? Yeah, I mean, and, and we've had, SSH. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have a number of our customers that were working with the SSH product with that do use Tectia, so we're actually working in conjunction with that product, your product as well, um, to, to fill customers' broad needs, because obviously you can't put you can't put the stuff everywhere, right? There are some cases where you don't have 100% uh, well, penetration. We have yet to find that OS we don't support, including even iOS, mainframes, Windows, so. Awesome, great. So there are multiple alternatives that are available. Yeah. Well, awesome. There's alternatives to the original. Great, thanks for being here, I appreciate it. Another one, yeah. With the technologies coming into place, similar to you know, the controlled man and attack on SSL, to be able to see what's going inside that SSL. Um, you know, there's technologies out now to go and do man and SSH, so I know that I want to only allow SFTP. I don't want to allow time to know those sorts of things. Um, when you do sort of those sorts of things, obviously the key's now coming from that man and the middle device. Um, are there any solutions out there that allow you to uh, account for the key to deal with those sorts of scenarios? without shutting everything down. I understand tech data to some degree, yes. Uh, but again, the, my concern is not everything things running that clock. You don't, I, I, whether I like it or not, I've got other SSH products out there, right? So I'm looking for more of something to help identify, uh, you know, technologies like that get turned on essentially within an organization. Yet as soon as you throw the switch, you've broken everything that's not ready for it, right? Right. So how do you deal with that? <laughs> Yeah, the question was kind of, yeah, the question was kind of extensive there. I, I, I don't know if you want to come on up afterwards maybe or if you want to dig into it now or why don't you come on up afterwards and we'll dig in. Okay. Awesome. Thanks a lot, everybody. really appreciate y'all being here today.